Intercostal block is a long-standing technique for providing analgesia to the chest wall. It's superficial and relatively simple to perform, especially if you follow the steps outlined in this video, in which we'll describe the anatomy, sonoanatomy, technique, and offer some tips for success. Some of you may be thinking, wait, I thought you loved paravertebral blocks, and I do, but lots of people aren't excited about the deep imaging at the paravertebral space and prefer a shallower approach where the visualization is easier. Intercostal is also a block that's widely used around the world by many specialties, emergency medicine, trauma surgery, thoracic surgery, and chronic pain specialists, so it does have a big role. Okay, let's see the anatomy. The ventral rami of T2 through T11 travel around the chest wall with their associated numbered ribs, innervating the thorax and abdomen. If we look from inside the chest at the ribs, we first have to peel away the parietal pleura. We then see the intercostal nerves running just underneath each rib in the costal groove. We've taken away the intercostal vessels to make things clearer. Superficial to the neurovascular bundle on the lateral chest wall is the internal intercostal muscle. It comes to an end at the angle of the rib about 5 centimeters off the midline and gives rise to the internal intercostal membrane. Deep to the nerve on the lateral chest is another muscle, the innermost intercostal muscle. How inner? The most. There is no membrane associated with this, so at the medial aspect the nerve is directly adjacent to the pleura. Here's a different way of looking at that. Lateral to the angle of the rib, we see external and internal intercostal muscle, the neurovascular bundle, and the innermost muscle. Medial to the angle of the rib, we lose the internal and innermost muscles, leaving only the external intercostal muscle and the internal intercostal membrane. We can see this change when we scan the posterior chest wall. Here's our initial medial view with the neurovascular bundle adjacent to the pleura. Note that we can't say for sure where the nerve is. As we move laterally, we pick up a very thin, dark layer deep to the vessels. This is the innermost intercostal muscle and as we slide medial, we lose it again. Here's where your needle tip should end up to be in the correct plane with the nerve. Now, does it matter which of these sites you choose to do the block? Not really. You'll get the same clinical effect, and it's really a matter of personal preference, convenience, and ergonomics as to where on the posterior chest while you perform the intercostal block. Personally, I prefer doing these close to the midline because it removes the scapula from the equation. I also prefer to not try to find a nuanced intermuscular plane with my needle where I risk putting the local in the wrong space. I'm happy to hydrolocate my way down to the pleura safely, then inject my local there. It's very reassuring to see the pleural depression as an endpoint for my injection. I know the block will work for sure. Here's a fantastic picture from Nysora and a link to their intercostal site. What we see is intercostal dye injection in a cadaver with the red dye spreading out superficial to the parietal pleura at each rib level and clearly covering the intercostal nerves. You can see the dye is not spreading to adjacent levels and we'll typically do separate injections for each one to make sure we get them all. Laterally, we can see the thin, wispy innermost intercostal muscles. With intercostal block, you'll get blockade of the entire spinal intercostal nerve, including both the lateral and anterior cutaneous branches. We use this block primarily for pain control after thoracic surgery, where it's been shown to improve respiratory function and for rib fractures. It's also a good choice for post-op analgesia after breast surgery and for relief of chest tube pain. Intercostal blocks are also used to treat pain related to shingles and postherpetic neuralgia for treatment of costochondritis and as a diagnostic block in chest wall pain. We can do this block in several positions. Sitting and prone are common options, but our preference is lateral. It allows you to stretch the patient's arm forward and or over their head to improve access to the posterior chest wall, and you'll have easy access to do both out-of-plane and in-plane approaches. All right, let's see how we'll do this. The needle approaches the intercostal space from cephal out in this instance, although you can come from either side. As we enter the intercostal muscle, we begin to use small squirts of saline to hydrolocate. We advance a millimeter at a time until we see the saline expanding over the pleura, then administer our local. If you see the extra pleural space expanding, you're in the right spot and your block will be solid. Same thing at the next level, hydrolocate, then give our local when we see the target space expand. Sometimes you'll see the internal intercostal membrane elevating along with the pleura depressing, like we see here. I prefer the out-of-plane approach, which uses the same principles. Hydrolocate, advance. Hydrolocate, advance, until you see that expansion above the pleura. It's a very safe method, and though you won't see your needle, the hydro keeps you safe. Oh man, that's sweet. Give your dose, and then move on. We'll use 3 to 5 mils of volume per level. We're really only after a sensory block here, and since it's a highly vascular area, we want to keep an eye on dosage. We like 0.2% rapivacaine with epinephrine as our agent of choice. 
There are some things to watch out for with intercostal block. First, this is a highly vascular area, typically one of the ones associated with a high likelihood of last. While the actual incidence is apparently quite low, care should be taken with dosages in small patients. Pneumothorax is a risk, but most of the reports come from landmark-based techniques. Careful hydrolocation and slow incremental advancement will ensure you don't drop a lung. Here are some intercostal tips. First, textbook illustrations have the intercostal nerve lying solely within the costal groove. And in general, they do run parallel, but there are many branches that run in the muscular space between the ribs. Don't try to get under the rib. You'll just lose your needle tip and potentially get into trouble. Land between the ribs and you'll be fine. Landmark-based approaches advocate for doing this block at the angle of the rib due to the relative absence of big back muscles such as erector spinae, rhomboids, trapezius, and latissimus dorsi, which make the depth to target significantly longer. However, this is less of a concern with the ultrasound approach unless the patient is extremely muscular or obese. Go where you see the space and pleura best and where you feel the most comfortable. And finally, there's a lot of cross coverage of adjacent dermatomes. If you're after a specific level, say for fractured ribs 4, 5, and 6, make sure you block the 3rd and the 7th intercostal nerve as well to ensure complete sensory block.